Professor uh, Laura Marafa, dear ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace be upon you all and a very good morning. Welcome to Masjid Amar and attend this public lecture organized by the Islamic Union of Hong Kong Yes Committee and the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Our topic today is a restored trust an Islamic perception on the environment and sustainable development. Without further ado, let me give the time to Professor Marafa. He's a professor at the Department of Geography and Resource Management at the University of Ch uh, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. He is also the director of postgraduate program in sustainable tourism. Professor Marafa will be our moderator this morning. Thank you, Professor Marafa. Thank you. <coughs> alaikum, brothers and sisters. Um, and good morning and welcome you all to this uh, you know, session. My assignment is very simple uh, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, normally when I hold the microphone I become very nervous. Uh, I like to talk without the microphone. Um, but I will introduce <coughs> our two important uh, personalities this morning on the table. Um, I am aware that we are supposed to start at 11.05, but we are now 11.18, so we will be working towards time so that we can have enough time, um, you know, for, for other things. So I will introduce the speakers. I have a Professor Ibrahim Ozdemar, um, and I will talk on seven points on each of them. Um, professor Ozdemar is a professor of philosophy uh, at Uskudar University, uh, Istanbul, Turkey, and he's also at the moment uh, with the University of uh, Finland. Yes. Yeah, in Finland. Um, he is a professor of philosophy and the founding president of uh, Hassan Kolyonsu University, uh, you know, in Turkey. Um, he has also been um, a very important person, a very prolific person. Uh, his major is in environmental ethics and environmental philosophy. Um, he has recently put together a document on the Islamic declaration of global change, uh, global climate change, and I think this is something that is very important and timely. He has also consulted for UNEP, uh, United Nations Environmental Program. Um, and he is also a member of the higher committee of the award for education with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, particularly on environmental management in the Islamic world. Uh, maybe I will stop there and then move on to Professor Lam Chuyin because the informations are just uh, too many. <clears throat> um, Professor Lam Chuyin, I think, in Hong Kong needs no introduction. Um, <laughs> he's someone who is like uh, a mentor to us, someone that we know very well, but I will mention anyway. Uh, he's currently with the Department of Geography and Resource Management um, at the Chinese University, that's where I am. Uh, he's a big guy, I'm a small guy in that place. Um, he is a chartered meteorologist. Uh, and that means, for since I came to Hong Kong, he's the one who has been monitoring the weather. If it's going to rain, it's going to be cold, it's going to be hot, he's the one. Um, and he actually studied physics, and then went on to read meteorology uh, in London, and then became the vice president of the World Meteorological Organization, the World Meteorological Organization. Um, there are said seven points, but I will probably just say that he is at the moment the chairman of the Hong Kong SAR Environmental Committee campaign. He is also the chairman of the Hong Kong Countryside Foundation. He used to be the president of Hong Kong Bird Watching, um, ex-director of the observatory. Uh, at the moment also he is leading a project in Lai Chi War for sustainable development. Um, I'm sure he will remember that at one time he told us, he told me in particular, that he came to the Chinese University to teach with a hidden agenda. 
because he wants to urge the students to be very much possible and responsible good men and women in their lifetime. I still remember that. So without further ado, I would like you to help me welcome all of them. At this moment, I will hand over to Professor uh, Osdemar um, for our speech, please, Professor Osdemar. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Yes. Yeah. Everything we start with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the merciful. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, any action of importance not begun with Bismillah is devoid of blessing and therefore incomplete. I will base the whole my idea of environment on Bismillah. And this is from Imam Ghazali, 12th century. Look at the beauty of this prayer and the environmental perception of this. It is in the in the in the in, in the in the introduction of Kitab uh, uh, Alchemy of Happiness, Kimya Isadet. Countless created equal to the number of stars in the sky, drops in the ra rainfalls, leaves of the trees, particles of sand and of the deserts. The atoms in the heavens and the earth is befitting only for Allah, whose attribute is His oneness and all majesty, greatness, highness, and excellence in specific, uh, is specific for Him. It, uh, is there be any good definition of environment than this? Yes, that's the second. And as we start with Bismillah, in the name of Allah, most gracious and merciful. I have to thank three people. Three people. One is the uh, Wang Dayu. It is, you know, 17th century, one of the first Muslim scholars in the real sense, who translated and who wrote a lot of books in Chinese. You know, uh, on my way, I wrote his book. I make some quotation from him. You will may be surprised about his perception of environment. Second is Liu Qi. It is also another Muslim, Chinese Muslim scholar. They are all pioneers. It is a duty on our shoulder to thank them, or okay, to 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 respect them. And. Uh, Sashiko Murata is the translator and writer of this book. She's a Japanese lady. She was at Harvard University. When she discovered Wang Tayu, she devoted her life to study his books and make them available in the, into English. And the third one is Aida Wong, a humble lady. I never met her. She just she just contacted me. She made this meeting possible. She invited me here. She said, you know, if you like to, if we organize at our Hong Kong with my Hong Kong brothers and sisters meeting, I said, anytime, anywhere, any Muslims, they ask me for something good, I am ready. And brother, just and here. You can remember this is also very, very important here. Maybe it is not, it is in Chinese, it, it, this is in the, in the Tanrim University Library. Man arafa rabbahu faqad arafa, man arafa nafsahu faqad arafa rabbahu. Who knows himself, he also knows Allah. It is also in Chinese. You see, this book, it is published in the States 
and we also one of the first book about Chinese Islam. Let's yes next slide. And why we start with the Bismillah? What is the meaning of Bismillah? With all relation with the nature, with all relation with the water we are drinking. When I drink my tea, I say Bismillah. When we are eating, we say Bismillah. What is this? We have to think within an environmental mentality to understand. Today, in one of the uh, Chinese Hong Kong newspapers, they say, "No, all the garbage from the world is coming to China to re for recycling." The Chinese government says, "We will not buy more garbage from the U.S." Everybody says, "We will. What we will do?" Because we are always consuming, consuming in unsustainable way. So, in the name of Allah says, the Prophet Muhammad says, all that is contained in the revealed books, in the Torah, in the Injil, in the Quran, is to be found in the Quran, and all that is contained in the Quran is summed up in the Surah Al-Fatiha. So, that's the first one. And here, the phrase of in the name of Bismi is an idiom having the connection of it. When we say Bismi, you say you have a card, you know, you have a card. If you put it, if you create it, you can, the door is open in two years. When you say Bismi, it means the blessing of Allah under the governance of Allah as an instrument of Allah as a representative of Allah, on behalf of Allah, with the support or uh, for the color uh, of Allah. So, so, in the name of, in the name of, in the case that one is submitting to honoring and glorifying that which is referred to. So could you imagine, from the beginning, we are, have a perception of universe, everything is connected to Allah. Yes? And, to my surprise, also to your surprise, all Islamic books, all Islamic books in geography, on mathematics, on astronomy, whatever, they start with Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Even, I was in Frankfurt two months ago, attend attending a conference, I saw that a translation of the famous Greek philosopher Aristoteles, Nicomachean Ethics, into Arabic, in 12th century. You see, there is Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. There is nothing to do with the, uh, this uh, Greek philosopher, with the, but it is a it is a adab of Islamic learning to start with Bismillah. And a German friend told me, Professor, you will be surprised. You know, Immanuel Kant, 18th century German philosopher, the father of enlightenment, one of the greatest philosophers in the history of philosophy. On his diploma, doctora diploma, with his handwriting, he writes, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, nobody knows the reason. This is how powerful is Bismillah. It's connecting us to the universe, to the everything. Yes? So, when we look at nature, some Muslim scholar says, in fact, all creation is saying Bismillah. For example, all three say in the name of Allah, fill their hands from the treasure of mercy and offer them to us. When you enter to a garden, there is a lot of fruits. On the, on the, on, on the, you know, uh, uh, on the tree, just cannot look at like a naturalist one, like a Darwinist one. It is from nature. We say, it is from Allah. It is from God. Therefore, we, we, when we have it, we say, Bismillah. All gardens say in the name of Allah and become cauldrons from the kitchens of divine power in which are cooked numerous varieties of the different foods. All blessed animals like cows, camels, sheep, and God say, in the name of Allah, and produce spring of milk from the abundance of the mercy, offering us a most delicate 
and pure food like the water of life in the name of the provider. Briefly, this blessed phrase is a mark of Islam and Muslims. It forms and shapes all perception of Allah, all perception of universe, and all perception of ourselves. So, without saying Bismillah, remembering Allah, you cannot interact with our environment. You cannot drink water. You can. You shouldn't drink water. You shouldn't drink eat. So you see, from so what is the environment? If you just listen to ecologists, listen to environmentalists, especially secular one, there is nothing to do with the religion. This is why they can't solve environmental problems. But we Muslims also have environmental problems in many Muslim countries because we don't understand this or religious values within an environmental context. Yes. So, this is why when we say environmental problems, there is deforestation, uh, 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 you know, floods, drought, hunger, racism, international migration, and international domestic terror. Men, for example, migration and inter some of terror is connected with environmental problems. The conflict, the war in Syria, first started as a result, as a reaction of the drought in the region. There was drought as a result of climate change. The villagers cannot pay their taxes to the state, but the arrogant, powerful state, no, you will pay, you have to pay. Then, when there was Arab Spring, it spread and it motivated people. No, there is a lot of dozens and millions of Muslims who suffered from this conflict. When we look at the root, there is some environmental causes for this. Yes. So, the problem is saving us. Social, economic, threats are aimed at everyone without discrimination, whether Christian, Jew, Hindu, Buddhist, or Muslim. We are all suffering from environmental problems. The teachings of the Quran and its, its embodiment in the life of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, may help us Muslims to understand their environment in a wider context and develop a spirit of care, compassion, and responsibility towards environmental problems. As our Imam is here, many scholars is here, we remember the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu wasallam, before he was Prophet, he was 25 years old, but he was a member of Hilfu Fudud, uh, 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 Fudud, as an NGO in, in Mecca, to just, to fight for injustice in the society. And when he was Prophet, he said, you know, I am always proud of to be a member of Hilfu Fudud. So, for environment, as we are on the same boat, we can work with all other, uh, the first slide, we can work with Buddhists, we can work, work with, with all of these people. As Professor Wal yesterday, I made a presentation to an uh, international conference yesterday. Americans, Japanese, everybody was there, from the people, from Christian people. Believe me, I presented Islamic value, I tried to present Islamic value. During dinner last night, many of them, they, they thanked me, you know, because they, you, we, we didn't know Islam is so uh, interested or what Islam has a so perception of environment. Yeah. So, oh, I am not inventing something from the Quran. When we look at the Islamic learning, when we look at the Muslim philosophers, you know, from Farabi, Ghazali, Ibn Rushd, Ibn Khaldun, all, they started from the Quran. They, they got their, in, their, their inspiration from the Quran. Theologians, theologians, mutakellimin, they based all their arguments on Quran. Sufi masters, look, Ehyay Ulumuddin, he based Tasawwuf on the Quran. And scientists, scientists, jurists, average Muslim who accepted 
uh, it as a daily sacred revelation from the, the first revelation to the present day. So, when we are trying to understand environment, ecology, nature, universe, we also have to first go to the Quran, read the Quran from a need. What Quran can say about nature, about universe, about environment, about water, about animals? Yes? And you all remember, especially men who went to Hajj, I don't know, visited the Jebel in Nur, where the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, used to go, used to go every year, every Ramadan, after he was 20, 30, 35 years old. But when he was 40 years old, on the Laylatul Qadr, the uh, Jabrail, uh, Jabrail, Angel Jabrail came in, he said, read, Iqra, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Iqra. And he says, I don't know how to, to read. Again, again, and the third time, he says, Iqra, Bismi Rabbika allazi khalaq, khalaq al-insana min alaq, Iqra, wa Rabbuka al-akra. Oh my God. When I read this with a, as an environmentalist, what is the meaning of Iqra? There is no book proper to read. He is what? Ummi. But, Bismi Rabbika lazi khalaq. Again, you see Bism. Bismillah. Bismi is there. In the name of God. There is a God and who is created the world. So, look at the world as a created. Because Arabs don't believe the world is created. They say the world is there. The nature is there. It is there. It is nature. It is world. It is the sky. It is. Yes? So, the key notion is that this reading should be in the name of Aurora, Rab, Rab in ladies, my sisters, before Quran revealed to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when you say Rab, Arabs understand housewife. Why? Rabbatul Bayt means who cares about the home, who cares about who, who manages the food, who manages the water, cleaning, everything. Quran, from the first verse, used this uh, concept, who cares about all universe, who cares about the all world. Rabbut uh, in the name of the Lord, who is the creator and sustainer of the universe, who sustains the universe. The major problem with some of Muslim philosophers, they don't understand under the impact of Greek philosophy, they said, Allah created the world, but it doesn't care for the world. No, says Imam Qasari, rahimahullah. He he continues to create, he continues to create, and he sustains the whole system. What is the meaning of this? Yes, Professor James, welcome. But the meaning of sustainable development now, we are now 10 years ago, let's say 20 years ago, there was no discussion of sustainable economy, sustainable this, sustainable this. All this is a new. Why? We, the scientists, made us to believe with arguments, with scientific data. The natural resources, the water of the world, the oceans, the, everything has a limit. It is not sustainable. So we have to change our attitudes. We have to change ourselves. So when we understand what is the meaning of sustain Allah in the name of Lord, who is the creator and sustainer of the universe, it means Allah to, to us. Therefore, from the very beginning, the Quran declares that Allah is the real creator, owner, and sustainer of all reality. If Allah is the owner of this water, you cannot consume it as you wish. This is why we say Bismillah when we are drinking, 
And then he finished to say, Alhamdulillah, praise to be Allah. Why? It belongs to him. But look at people, rich people, this is my, I, they just, uh, you know, eat half of their food, they put the other to the garbage, they don't care. It's, uh, it is my money, it is my life, it is my property, I can do what other I, I wish I can do. But the very teaching of the Quran brings a limit to all perception and all the conception patterns. Yeah. Therefore, the impact of this earlier verses should not be underestimated as they were shaping the Muslims' worldview as well as identity vis a vis pagan perception of nature. Everything starts, works, and moves in his name, and he is the one who creates, originates, and teaches. Well, whatever man learns and whatever experience and knowledge he requires come originally from Allah, who Allah bil qalam. He has told man what he did not know. Yes, next thing. So, Allah is presented to the first Muslims. The Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sayyidina Khatija, then Sayyidina Ali, this a hand for Muslims, you know. When Sayyidina Umar was converted to Islam, it was 14 Muslims. And for 13 years in Mecca, they just was reading and reading these verses. This first chapter of Quran, Ukra bismi rabbika lazi khala. After this, there was, there, 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 there was no new revelation for almost three years. Therefore, this verse is just, you know, it is not, it was just, you know, in the, in, in the psyche of Muslims. There was become everything with the impact of these verses. Allah as a creator, Lord and sustainer of all the world occurred very often through the Quran. The word Allah with over 2,800 occurrences, Rab, the Lord, Master or Lord, over 950 occurrences as a very important message for Muslims. Who is your Lord? Who is your Rab? Who is, who, it's Allah. He is Allah. So, this, this, this must shape and, you know, uh, shape and form your perception of yourself and your universe. The Quran is using the same word or root over and over again was, and still is the surest way to have the message it contains registered in the minds of the listeners. Yes, next. So, we come to the first chapter of the Quran, Surah Al-Fatiha. You see, in 2002, February, Mr. Gorbachev, the former, the last uh, president of the uh, Soviet system, invited 400 scholars to Lyon in France for a conference, what religion can say about environment, sustainability, like this conference. And, when I was traveling from Frankfurt, I was teaching in the U.S. at that time. I changed my plane from Frankfurt to Lyon. I saw an old man with a heavy handbag and also with a stick in his hand, but long bread, you know, it's an old man. He was waiting in the same game, just automatically. I said, sir, if you like, I can help give you two suitcase to the plane. He said, why? I said, my religion and my culture tells me to respect other people. He said, what is your religion? I said, I am Muslim. He gave his back to me. He said, I can trust you. And then in the plane, we sit to each other and he was the, one of the highest bishops of Russia and friend of Gorbachev, and he is going to the same meeting. And he introduced me to the Mr. Gorbachev. Then Mr. Gorbachev said, atheism doesn't work. We need the message of religions to solve, to solve environmental problems, to solve poverty, to solve uh, hate language, 
to overcome terrorism, a lot of problems. We need a new understanding, new inspirations from religious leaders. And they, they gave us eight minutes. Just eight, yes, minute <laughs> to, to finish. I hope you will give me a little bit more. Okay. Uh, because I just want to share, because this is the bracket of, of, of the Fatiha, I, I want to share with you. I, I, I don't tell this everywhere. And then Mr. Gorbacho said, I ask every member of religions to make, to, to start with uh, each panel with a prayer. And the first prayer was oldest religion of, uh, as an old religion, was a Jewish uh, prayer. I still remember the name of the rabbi from, it was Rabbi of Amsterdam, his, his name was Abraham. Uh, I met him two years ago in, in, in Germany again. When it comes to me, I just, I couldn't decide what to read. There's a lot of good prayers in the Quran. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanata wa fi akhirata wa A lot of Rabbana la tu akhirna inna sinna wa But, I decide to read Fatiha. Why? Because every Muslim recites this short surah of seven verses at least 17 times a day, sometimes more than 50 to 40 times. And in this short surah contains a great deal of the central basic ideas of Islam as beliefs and concepts. It outlines many of its, its essential perceptions and attitudes. All this makes it clear why it was chosen for frequent recitation and why it is essential for the validity uh, validity of the prayer, reading it again and again in print and registered the meaning and the message of uh, his uh, this blessed verses in our minds and hearts. And let's look at this chapter with an environmental mindset and see how it presents the words to us. It starts, all praise be to Allah, the sustainer of the world. We start with praising Allah sustainers of the world. That's it. When I recited this in Arabic, then translate it into English, the whole, you know, 400 scholars, they're just speechless. Many of them, during our conference, they say, still the Arabic recitation of Quran is, you know, in our ears. This is the, this is the impact of this Fatiha. Yes, it is gone. So, from the start, we have a second environment. You see? We should not forget that the sustainer, the Lord, and the owner of all environments at the name, at the same time, is all creator. Heavens, the planets, the stars, the galaxies, the earth, oceans, seas, lakes, rivers, lofty mountains, for us, all living creatures, that is all natural phenomena, created and sustained by Allah, constitutes our environment. We are living this environment. Thus, when we say environment, we understand all these natural phenomena as a whole. Moreover, we can add to the natural environment or social environment too. The latter include the social environment. Many environmentalists, they neglect this. They're only interested in the rivers, in the seas, in the oceans, etc. But we have to, poverty, homelessness, migration problems, racism, abandoned children, drug abuse, alcohol, addiction, labor, and other problems is also our social environment. That's, yes. And this is, this is my proof. See? Let me just remind you a saying of the Prophet regarding our very social environment. He reminds us, his friends, he is not believer whose stomach is filled by the neighbor to his side goes hungry. See, we have to care about our social environment. And he doesn't say your Muslim neighbor. Because at that time in Medina there was Jewish there was Jewish people, there was Christian people. We have to care about our neighbors. Today it can be Buddhist, it can be Hindu, it doesn't matter. We have to care 
about our neighbor, social environment, then I don't know, maybe there is some other scholars, they correct me. One of the first men in the human history says about the right of the right of the uh, wind. Because the Medina was very hot, Mecca Medina, if you have a taller building, you cannot have wind. Blizzing, you know. The Prophet said, no. You have to, when building a house, you must not prevent your neighbor to have wind. Look at this mentality, mindset. So, modern 21st century Muslims have to be more active in environmental uh, uh, environmental uh, uh, awareness and also uh, fighting against environmental problems. Yes, let's go. And again, there is a lot of verses in the Quran, you know. Before Islam, Arabs don't believe there is something important in the nature. Nature was purposeless, meaningless and useless for them. They're just interested in the beauty of nature for poetry. But again and again, from the first verses to the last verse of the Quran, Quran says, everything has been created with a specific order, duty, meaning and purpose. Nature is not out there by accident as a result of the process of blind and random evolution or chaotic configuration without meaning and, uh, or purpose. Nature has an order, meaning and purpose. So, therefore, if human ponders and uh, scrutinizes the very structure of natural phenomena, he can deduce the existence of a creator who is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-merciful. Then he can discover his responsibilities. Yes, next. And this is why, you know, Muslims look at nature like a divine book. Nature having a firm and well-knit structure with no gaps, no ruptures, no dislocations is regarded as one of the grand handiwork of the Almighty. Like a mirror, nature reflects the power, beauty, wisdom and mercy of Creator. I will show you a painting now later. You will, it will, uh, you will understand this very well. If there was not such a nature, we could not understand Allah. When we say Allah, it, 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 it will make no, no, no sense for us. Let's go again. Again, let's, let's test this also. And, uh, yes, uh, we can also go this one. I was, I was, let's go. Yes. Here, I am reading this book, The Amazing Unity of the Universe with evolutionary mentality. He just this all this beauty, but he doesn't ask who is the owner, who is the sustainer. He says, I am scientist, I don't ask these questions. But Quran very often invites us to 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 to, to have contemplation, tefakkur over the nature. You see? Or the everything. Yes? And Mevlana Celaleddin Rumi, who was born in Afghanistan and then passed away in Konya. Do you know what you are? You are a manuscript of a divine letter. Microcosmos of a divine letter. You are a mirror reflecting noble face. This universe is not outside of you. Look inside yourself. Everything that you want, you are already there. This is why I just presented a book of the cover of uh, uh, one uh, uh, one time book, it says that man arafa nafsahu fakat arafa rabbahu. It is the same, yes? So, again, a Sufi poet from Damascus, Sham, Nablusi, he says, you know, ta'ammal sutura al-kainati فَإِنَّهَا مِنَ الْمَلَاءِ الْأَعْلَى إِلَيْكَ رَسَائِلٌ Reflect upon the lines of the book of the universe. For there are letters to you from the highest real, from the divine. 
The book of creation displays orderliness as clearly as midday sun. Exhibits the powers, the powers miracle and every word or, or letter. Yes? So, you all know this painting, Mona Lisa. Right? And this is Da Vinci, the painter. If we don't have this one, I say you, I wrote many books, how great is Da Vinci as a painter? Nobody will make any sense. But when you put this in Louvre Museum in, in Paris, you go there, you don't need a guide. Where I, I visited this painting, wherever I go, she is looking at me. Everybody says she is looking at me. This is a, it is a masterpiece, you know. We you know his greatness through this, his paintings. You know, the best known, the most visited, the most written about, the most sung about, the most uh, 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 provided work of the art of the world. And it is value in 1926, when I was two years old, was 100 million dollars. No, it is 800 million, million dollars. This is a painting made by man. Just come before the, the first one again. Yeah. So, no, 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 no. Yes, no, yes. So, if, if a painting of Da Vinci worth eight million dollars, so what Nablusi is saying, trying to say us, there is everything is a letter from God to you. I still say the letters, you know, uh, my wife, when we uh, know each other, we were sent, sent to me. She has a meaning for me. It is not only paper, it is not only ink. There's a lot of things. This is why if a painting of Da Vinci worth 800 millions. So, we Muslims, we have to look nature, environment with this mentality. It is, it is a letter from Allah to us. And in the museum, it is, you know, it is forbidden to go near to the, to the painting for security reasons. I just saw a tourist just making, make like this, take my picture please. Then security came, said, you must shame yourself. I said, what's up? It's just, I, I, I took a picture, I, 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 didn't, I, I didn't make any harm. The security woman says, these paintings does not belong to France. It belongs to humanity. It is a legacy of humanity. You can't do that. So, my Muslim sisters and brothers, if there is an environmental problem, if they are there, 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 uh, somebody is dis destroying our natural beauty, we cannot just look from the, uh, uh, from a distance. Yes, let's move uh, again, yes. And again, from the one uh, Thais book, you know, on my way, I just make a co this quotations. It is, you know, 300 years ago, Look, in order to attain a resemblance to the real, it means Allah, one needs to observe the, the clear mandate and recognize the real Lord who transforms and produ produces everything. To do this, one needs to know the relation between the real Lord and the universe. And if you can't recognize yourself, you can't uh, investigate things. If you can't invest investigate things, you cannot exhaustively research for the principle. If you can't uh, 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 exhaustively search the principle, you cannot purify your nature and purify your heart. Hence, you cannot discern your origin. If you cannot discern your origin, you cannot know the utmost sage. You cannot know either Prophet Muhammad or Allah. This is why he writes here, Man arafa nafsahu, fakat arafa nabdahu. You see, to know Allah, to know our Prophet, we have, to, we have to start with ourselves, we have to start with our environment, and uh, yes. This is why in the creation of heavens and earth, inna fi khalqis samawati wal ardi wa akhtilafi layli wal nahari la ayyatin li ulil al-ba'd. 
الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُنَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا وَعَلَى جُنُبِهِمْ وَيَتَفَجَّرُنَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاتِ وَالْعَرْضِ ربنا ما خلقنا هذا باطلا That's enough for, for a Muslim to have a perception of environment Yes So this is why Quran again and again invites us, you know to consider camels and how they are created You know Camels was the Arabs' best friend. They know him, they know camel very well. But why Quran inviting them to look at the camel who they are created? Again, we have to understand the creation. We have to understand the, the link between creation and creator. Yes. And again, you know, it, in the Quran it says, you know, there is a chapter, Surah names, is Surah to Nam. Again, This is a scientist, uh, there's a campaign in the U.S. because of uh, pesticides that a lot of bees is dying. Because the role of bees in the, in the, eco, eco, in the ecological uh, system, if they say if the bees die, we will, there is a lot of ecological problems. So, save the bees, there's a campaign. So, we Muslims must be first to, yes, We must must search to, to 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 care about the bees because Allah says you know it is everything happening even bees build their houses by inspiration from Allah. Allah said I inspire bees. There is a relation between me and Allah. So it means there is a, between all animals. So look at your all perception. Quran presents us. A colorful, meaningful, and living world, world reveals itself in, 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 in his poetry, yes. Let me mention this. Again, this is one of the first translations of the Quran. Uh, the first one? Yeah. Yes. This is uh, Abdullah Yusuf Ali from India. He devoted almost 40 years for this translation. He visited all places mentioned in the Quran. And he had very beautiful interpretation of on these verses of Bakara, Inna fi khalqi samawati wa ta'ala. You should refer this and I will also give leave this to you. Yes, let's go. And uh, yes, also this. And Prophet or Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam must be all role model for environmental protection. In the colonial time, in the post-colonial time, when we were for, fighting for our independence, it was legitimate to see Prophet as a military commander, as a statement. But we forget the Prophet's relation with the animals, with the nature, with the water, his camel relations. You see, he is teaching about the nature. So it is time to discover another dimension of our prophet. You see, because as also uh, uh, one is very, he says, insani kamil, the, the concept of insani kamil, he, he has in the Chinese Muslim uh, books too. And the Quran says, you know, indeed you have been endowed with a noble character to the prophet, and again it says, in the messenger of Allah, you have a beautiful pattern of conduct. I am environmentalist. I am looking, I am reading his life, how beautiful environmentalist he is. I wrote a book in Turkish, I hope it will be translated into other languages. I devoted almost 10 years reading all classical sources, not, I am not talking about the wars, there is a lot of books doing this, I am not talking how, how a great, great leader he is, there is a lot of books out there. I just devoted a chapter to his friendship with his camel, Kusva. Do you remember when he was making hijrah? He came out of the, 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 the cave on Mount Hera and Abu Bakr said, this is a present camel for, him, for you. He said, I don't accept it as a present. I, have to, I want to pay. And he paid for the camel because it was a very important message. He was making, he, he, the Islamic history was in a turning point. And he kept this camel in all his life. 
We have sayings from Anas bin Malik, one of his close friends, Sahaba. He says, whenever we stop, we make a break. The Prophet وسلم, never drink water and eat his meal before giving water to his camel. Look at this compassion. Look at this mercy. Let's go, yeah. So, there's a lot of examples in his life, you know. And anyone who gives a sparrow because good reason will be called to the account by Allah at the last judgment, he says. And he also, they should not be ill-treated animals, but should be well looked after, kept clean, and the put in more suitable to their natures, should not be loaded with burdens greater than they can bear, uh, put a ban on hunting, forbidding arbitrary hunting of animals uh, of pleasure. It uh, brings an ethics, environmental ethics, yes, about environmental uh, protection. This is very important. One day, you know, he said, a traveler left a great thirst, felt a great thirst as he went to a, on his way to so stop at the well and drank of water. Who made Hajj can understand this better. At this hut, at the desert, men went to the well and drank water. Then when he came out, there was a dog. He was, you know, licking the mud because of thirst. Then he told this animal is thirsty like I was. He went back down to the well and filled his shoe with water. Then holding it firm, returned and had it for the dog to drink. Allah praised that servant of his for his act and forgive all his sins. And the question, so are we rewarded for watering animals? What is the importance of animals? Say one of his friends. And he says, there is a reward for giving any living creature a drink, a food, whatever. This is why there is a culture of compassion to the animals in the Muslim culture. Let's finish it. Okay, so there was Hima in, 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 inviolable zones, which is uh, called uh, sanctuaries around Mecca and Medina. You can't kill any animals, you can't cut any trees. In the day of the Prophet, now we call it national parks. Yes? There is also Sufi perspectives I made also from uh, Jalaluddin Rumi and uh, 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 let's go. I also, because especially, especially uh, Chinese Islam is influenced by the Sufism very much. You see, therefore we have a lot to learn from our Sufi tradition, Sufi masters, especially on environment. You know, because in Sufi, there is, you know, if everything is alive, created by compassionate, creative and loving Allah, then human beings are not outsiders and slaves in a hostile and brute and natural environment. So, for, for, for example, for Rumi, every leaf on a tree and every bird in a bush offers praise and thanks, uh, thanksgiving to Allah's greatness and sustains. Just look at your nature, your environment with this mentality. Yes? So, the, the, uh, let me finish. Let me finish. Allah created the universe and adorned the skies with the sun, the moon, and the stars. And, and the face of the earth with flowers, trees, gardens, orchids, and uh, various animal species. Allah causes the rivers and streams to flow up of the skies without support, cause the rain to fall and place the boundary between night and day. Therefore, the universe, with all its richness and vitality, is the work and art of Allah and creates and sustains all plants and animals as space in this way, causing their protection. So, nature is a balanced, just, peaceful, unified pattern created by and functioning according to Allah's design, each part having its own purpose, each role within an interlocking whole. So, if a Mona Lisa is so bored, is protected in Lur Museum, this universe, this environment, the protection of all this is, is on our shoulders. Thank you very much. Can I 
hopefully not very bad, uh, five minutes ahead. Uh, may I invite Professor Lam Chu Yin, um, our uh, discussant, to please have some more speech. Professor Lam, please. Uh, Professor Lam will speak for about 20 25 minutes and then we will open up for questions and answers. Assalamualaikum. Um, uh, Professor Ostami, uh, thank you very much for the uh, very compassionate lecture, um, which is uh, so revealing to us. Um, I'm not a Muslim, but I think I share a lot with you. Um, I, I'm particularly impressed or moved by, by the representation which says that everything you see in nature or around you is effectively the, the language of Allah to all of us, the language. Um, without using human language, um, we are actually receiving messages um, from Allah. Um, well, the cup here doesn't say anything in human language. Uh, the birds, when they fly, they are not saying any human language. But when you see they fly, you must be impressed or surprised that they could actually fly. How, how could a healthier than air being fly in air? Uh, there are so many surprises in the world. Um, I was walking outside in Oil Pan, we call it Oil Pan Road, and before, the, before I went, before I came here, and uh, I saw very beautiful looking plants on the roadside, on the curb, um, which I always admire. I actually started admiring plants on the curbside since last year. And no one plant, no, no human beings planted them. Um, no one designed where they should occur. But they are there, um, telling us that life could occur anywhere. Um, and then one could ask, why should they be there? What purpose are they performing? Um, those, pe those people who are only interested in money will say that they are useless. They are weeds. They have to be removed. But of course, we know very well that everything, living or non-living, play a role in the unity of everything. Actually, in my course, I teach a subject. I, I teach a certain, a certain subject called Gaia, G-A-I-A. And um, most people think that, oh, say, this is a piece of air. Um, but then, do you realize that actually in here, there is life. A lot of bacteria. <laughs> bacteria. Um, but in the Western world, in, in, in their form of science, they think that this particular say, a box is an empty space filled with dead air, and then the, the bacteria are things added to this cube. This is a very artificial view. We should always realize that any space, one meter, one meter, one meter, it is not just space and air, it is always life with the space. It's like people saying that, oh, in the sea we have fish. See, this is the sea, 
and this is full of water, and then there, there you find fish. But this is a very artificial view. Wherever you go in the sea, you take a cube, the fish is always there. So it's part of the sea. It is not the sea plus fish. Um, so the, the, the Western world has distanced us, I mean distanced life from space and the material. It's like the earth, the water and air. They talk as if earth, water and air are independent identities separate from life. But that's totally wrong. We also have the fire. Um, and some of you, uh, can, I, can I say a little bit about science? <laughs> um, we have Mars and Venus as our brother or sister planets. This is the Sun. We have, we have Venus and then the Earth and then Mars. Well, we are brothers. But we are so, so very different. On Venus, on Mars, we have more than 90% carbon dioxide. You know carbon dioxide. Um, on Earth, it is only 0.04%. But on Earth, we have 21% oxygen. They have very little. So we are brothers, but we are so very different. So what's the, what's the reason? The reason is that on Earth, from a long time ago, we have things like bacteria, things with, uh, it looks so, I forget about what, what it looks so is in English. Chlorophyll. Huh? Oh, yeah, chlorophyll. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, and then, ever since we have life on Earth, um, anything with chlorophyll will turn carbon dioxide into oxygen. So to, to, to run this long story short, in the end we have a lot of carbon dioxide in the air, and then we have uh, very little carbon dioxide in our air, but a lot of oxygen. So many people think that the physical world controls the biological world. So if this is hot carbon metric, then you can only have certain kinds of plants. If it is cold climate, you have other kinds of plants. So many people think that the so-called physical world controls the biological world. But from the example I've just quoted, you will realize that biological world actually also affects the physical world. Is that understandable? I, I, I have not spoken English for a long time, so it's a little bit rusty. <laughs> So, so it's about the very important point. Um, this world we are in is a has a balanced, just, peaceful, unified pattern, and that pattern includes numerous members in the community. It is a community. It could be the inside the community. We have earth, water air and fire, which most people will relate to as so-called dead and meaningful, senseless things. But we also have ants, bees, grass, flowers, trees, fish, many, many kinds of different living things. And they together, together with land, uh, together with earth, fire, air, together, the so-called physical world and the biological world, they actually work together so that everything is recycled within our Earth. And during this recycling process, everyone has a moment of glory. We could be here for a few decades, flowers maybe for a few months. Uh, the individuals may die, but the species go on. Um, uh, a certain place might, might, might be destroyed by volcano, but within a few years or a few decades, 
the world will work itself and we create a, a new ecosystem which benefits from the surrounding earth, air, water, and sunshine, energy. Um, so it, for a long time, no, maybe for 200 years in the Western world, they treat, they treat nature or environment as something they could exploit for, the, for human beings' own benefit uh, to, to enhance so-called quality of life, but actually enhancing material ownership. Um, that was a very wrong view. The world is not created just for man. We, but we, they did, we are a community. The camel is our friend, the dog is our friend, even the ants, the bees, they are our friends. They all serve their own purposes in the, in the wholeness of things. Um, and uh, that's why when we look at the world, we should we just we cast an eye with with love, with compassion, and take good care of whatever we see, whatever comes to our side. Um, the world now is overwhelmed by we call it egoism or ego being, being egocentric. And the last word I know is meism. You know the word meism? Me ism. But it's word is worse than egoism. <laughs> but but the trouble is that our very young generation they have been they have been brought up thinking that they are the center of the universe. But actually of course there are numerous centers of universe. Every being is a center of universe. It has its own purpose. But the so-called own purpose is also part of the bigger purpose. Um, so it is very important for us to to teach our kids, uh, to influence our friends, and try to convince them that they are only part of a very big web, a big web of things, so-called physical things or living things. Physical things are no different from living things. Living things are no different from physical. Even the piece of rock, we should respect it. Because the rock is there to serve some purpose. Um, in the weathering of rocks, they actually are serving a very useful purpose in maintaining the composition of the atmosphere for us to live in. And the rivers, they bring nutrients down the river into the sea, nurturing feed creatures in the sea, but then the nutrient will eventually evaporate, transform to something else, uh, something called dimethyl sulfide, a very complex uh, chemical compounds. They go back into the air, the winds will bring them back to the land. So we have a lot of natural cycles. And we, we may not know it, but they are working to, to sustain us and all other beings, not just sustaining us, but all other beings in the world. So it's, it's, it's a, a grand form of harmony, and um, I I really like the, the 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 way it is said that uh, whatever you see is actually the language, or to me it's the language of nature, but to me it's the language of Allah, and be sure when you see anything, feel your heart with compassion with love and with gratefulness because they are not there 